one, one other, and it appears she's not going to show. So <clears throat> I will call the meeting to order at 10.13. We have some new faces, so let's run around the room and everybody can introduce themselves. I am John Fronson. I am co-chair of the Sunset <coughs> Vine and Hollywood Entertainment District uh, Security Committee, along with Fred. And um, I own the property at 1720 North Whitley, the historic Whitley Park bungalows. I'm Carrie Morrison, Executive Director of the BID. I'm Joseph Mariani, I'm on staff here with the BID. Carol Massey, McDonald's. Bobby Conti, stakeholder of Sunset and Vine. Sergeant Ben Fernandez, Los Angeles Police Department. Fred Rosenthal, co chair of the Security Committee, and uh, I'm an amateur. So I'm an archive. Steve Seiler, BID Security Director. My name is Carlos Gonzalez. I'm the uh, new program administrator at the Hollywood uh, Wine Guard Center, the Youth Center next door. And I'm Karen Weiner. I'm the director here at the Women. John Adams, Andrews International. Shirley Schumacher, Andrews International. John Muldoon, Andrews International. Ralph oh, Ferrar, Andrews. Dave Storper, uh, Hollywood. Joe Salazar, Fit Security. And um, Karen, who has been so gracious in hosting us these past several months, um, has asked if she could make a little announcement about an upcoming event. Of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we actually, I met uh, a couple, um, Don and Bradley Gregg, at a meeting kind of randomly last week. And Don knows, I guess, a lot of artists and street artists. And one or two artists coming to paint some murals on our wall has turned into six, I guess, very well-known famous street artists are coming on Monday to paint murals on the walls here at our site. And they're going to have a, a crew. I guess her husband's a producer and actor, and so he's going to bring a film crew to, to film it, maybe for a documentary. I'm not clear on that. Um, and the media is going to be here. It's going to be quite a big event. So it should be a really fun, interesting day, kind of exciting. And it's just kind of evolved over the past few days. Um, so if anyone wants to stop by, kind of see what's going on, see what they're doing. And, and it'll be fun. We'll have some <coughs> food here. What time, Karen? Um, it'll be from 10 to 4. Great. Are they painting inside the murals yes. on, on inside the walls or uh, outside? No, they're going to be painting inside. And um, <clears throat> I guess the artists have, we've sent them pictures. They've picked their walls. Um, we have a board member that um, provided some money for a stipend for them to purchase some supplies. So it's kind of slowly coming together. Do yeah. these artists do this um, on a regular basis? Yes, they're, um, I have the names of them. Because we were, uh, our streetscape committee yeah. uh, did a walk through both of us <coughs> and looked at some places that we thought would be wonderful for street art. Like uh, a wall mural. Wall mural. Oh, so, really? Yeah. Yeah. So you might want to come by. Um, so yeah. they're very, I guess they're very well known street artists. They have, I have a list of their names. Um, and maybe come by and talk with them and they could, you know. Yeah, because they might do something for you. Yeah. It's actually a pretty popular, well, it's not popular yet, but it's it's very cool and cutting edge in an office building now where they, they paint the wall, a couple of walls relatively boring white colors and then they'll do one in some really cool street art and it really just sort of activates the whole space. Mm -hmm. I've seen it in a couple of buildings and <clears throat> it's catching on. Well, they also do, you know, art that they show in galleries as well. I know one of them she mentioned does art for, has been commissioned to do art for like Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, and I don't know, she's thrown out some other names and stuff. So they're pretty, this group is, you know, they're out there, they're doing their thing, they show in galleries and. So, Local artists, they're all from Hollywood or? Yeah, from they're all from, Hollywood. yeah, the LA Hollywood area. That's great. Mm -hmm. Do we need to give you our name to get in to see what's going on? No, you can just come just in. Just show up. <laughs> Sounds okay. great. Thank you. All right, anyone else, <clears throat> excuse me, with any public comment today? Okay, let's move on to uh, just point out the meeting notes are in your packet. Uh, if they're not, they should be on the table right there. Uh, these are the meeting 
<clears throat> notes from April 9th. <clears throat> if you um, if you are here, take a take a look and notify Joe if there's any uh, error, errors or discrepancies. I do. As we do not need to approve them, but it's always good to keep them accurate. Let's move on to um, some new business. We're if you take a look at the forest green. Yeah, deep green. Deep green. Um, when there were when there were green forests, this was the. That's color. right. That's right. There's a two two sided deep green piece of paper that we're rolling out this meeting to try to organize our uh, issues as it relates to Hollywood safe sidewalks and also Hollywood safe nights. Um, we have some several categories bolded on the left column. Uh, urgent is and pressing is is something that we um, we want to put at the at, at the uh, front of the line and I'll probably be discussing uh, thoroughly and uh, possibly taking some action on. In process is what we keep we continue to work on um, along with some other stakeholders in the Hollywood area, whether it's Hollywood Forward or PATH or um, LAPD, and then obviously there's a lot of things to monitor, especially as it relates to city regulations and state regulations, and then um, what we've recently accomplished, and then things that we are, we're aware of but we're not acting on, and, and uh, we're going to call those part. So anybody who has any comments on, this is the first rollout of this document, so... Feel free to review it and uh, suggest any changes. Carrie, do you want to talk about any of this? Yeah, I, mean, I just want to bring to your attention some of the things that have happened in the last month. And um, so we'll start with the Safe Hollywood Sidewalks. And where this comes from is, is the annual uh, work plan for the Hollywood bid. So it doesn't, it's not the work plan for the sunset bid, but if it's, this is not a, um, a good way to do this, we can talk about it, but we have four key areas that the Hollywood bid have determined are thematic um, goals for the for the bid, and two of them intersect with the security committee, so of course, Safe Hollywood Sidewalks and Safe Hollywood Nights, and you can see the goal at the bottom of, of each of these pages as to what the general goal is. So urgent and pressing, um, the city's uh, proposed sidewalk vending ordinance is, is going to have four public hearings in the next month and a half or so. Um, as I think we have kept you apprised in the last couple meetings that um, there is a huge organizing effort to um, promote uh, sidewalk bending throughout the entire city. Um, and we have written a letter on behalf of both the Sunset Bid and the Hollywood Bid suggesting, you know, look, sidewalk bending is what different parts of the city want, that's great, but we would recommend that the ordinance would allow a community to opt out of that. And Hollywood in particular already has so many issues on its sidewalks, and also we are concerned about the impact on businesses that are paying payroll taxes and their bid assessments and, and you know, everything else that, that would infringe on their business. So um, I could use some suggestions. We, we did get a, a call from Central City Association who is organizing business people to speak at these hearings and to the media about what the impact would be on brick and mortar businesses if this were to go through. And um, Frank Michelli and George Cambion uh, have both agreed to be um, spokespersons for this area, but if there are other businesses, and you know, if you have tenants who would want to also be trained to be able to be media savvy on this, let me know and we'll connect them with CCA. And I will get back to you because I think we do need to have business presence at these hearings. Um, homelessness, you may have seen, well, I'm sure you saw, the, uh, the official homeless count numbers came out Monday and they show, um, saw the, the Times homelessness is up in LA everywhere. Uh, we knew, we kind of knew this was coming and, and this kind of, you know, reinforces the uptick in calls and complaints that we're getting from businesses in our community about people who are, it's not just the, it's not just the same homeless um, problem that we have experienced in the past, but there's increased um, violence and uh, uh, increased mental illness, and we've been talking about this for months. So it's validated by this, by this report, 
One of the things that's interesting in the results is that the, the number is up 12% uh, for the county and 12% for the city. And what's interesting is that it's up in every council district and it's up in every supervisorial district. So that is this, um, it's in, in all places that even maybe did not see visible homelessness in the past couple of years, it's, it's up throughout the city. The, the big jump happened in um, a demographic that we also noticed when we were doing our count here a couple months ago in encampments, vehicles, and tents and makeshift shelters. There was an 85% increase countywide in, in you know, these kinds of um, uh, you know, metrics. And uh, there's going to be further research to determine, this is kind of the, why the discussion has been that uh, one of the underlying reasons for the increased uh, homeless count is because the economy has obviously had a, a significant impact on people, wage erosion and affordable housing, um, loss of affordable housing. So that those two things working against us that you likely are going to have more people who are going to be living in their car, or living in their in their RV, etc. So that was the big metric that changed. Um, so one of the things that um, we're doing about this, you know, the business improvement districts throughout the state are going to come together in a summit on June 30th, and I'm on the steering committee for that because we feel that in business improvement districts, we're, we're at the forefront of trying to address our, our homeless neighbors. We know them. We know all of them. We have worked hard to help them, and this is, this is throughout the state. Um, we find ourselves constantly on the, de the defensive, like with the Right to Rest Act, you know, where the legislation specifically said that BIDs could not interact with people who are homeless on the street or that would be considered harassment. So we're gonna come together and um, talk about whether or not there's a more proactive stance for business improvement districts to, to take on this issue. Um, another thing that uh, we're working on, and this goes into the in-process section, it was really interesting to see that in the LA Times, when they illustrated the, the photo that accompanied um, the story was a photo of Richard McFarthing here on the Walk of Fame in front of Billy Reed's building at, at uh, Coenga. We know Richard very dearly. We have been working with Richard since 2006. He is the number one person on our top 14 list, the number one most vulnerable person, most likely to die on the streets of Hollywood. And um, so it prompted me to write an email to the author saying, you know, it's interesting that if you're going to use Richard McFarlane as the poster child for this story, we want to talk to you about everything we have done to try to help Richard. The multiple attempts to have him 5150, to you know, to have him safely hospitalized, um, to deal with paramedics that we've called. Steve has sent me just reams of data on the times we've called the paramedics, thinking that he had actually died. He looked dead. He drinks alcohol all day that people buy for him. He is a classic case of someone who basically is being left to perish on our streets despite everyone's best efforts. So um, maybe out of this kind of interesting inclusion of his photo, we can tell the story of what we've been trying to do because he's not the only one out there as, as we know. Um, also, what we have been working on um, at the request of all of you is a way to um, educate visitors, <coughs> tourists, uh, passers-by, that giving money to panhandlers is actually not helping them or helping the situation. Um, so what we're, what we're proposing now, and we really want your input on, and you can take this back and get some feedback back to me, um, maybe within the next week, is creating this card um, that would be, a, it would be handed out to visitors that would, on the one hand, advise people that they don't have to give money to CD vendors or the characters, that those people are not officially connected to any studio or the city, <clears throat> and that also that providing spare change to people on the street is not helpful, that there are actually organizations here in Hollywood that you know, are, are working with this population, and we would encourage giving money to those organizations. So the purple is the beginning text of a website. We would create a, a, a special website called hollywoodsafesidewalks.org, and as you can see, this card would be translated into a couple Asian languages and Spanish, and we would um, seek the cooperation of 
the hotel concierges, the tour bus operators, uh, property managers for the, the um, you know, the apartment buildings, for the commercial office space, to hand these out and um, promote driving people to this website to find out how they can redirect their good intentions. So please read this as if you were a, you know, just a normal Joe Q public and see if you think this gets at what you would want to um, know and if it would, if it would, it would seem helpful. So that's, that's in the works. Um, another thing that's in process is that, you know, we've been talking for more than a year about the significant problem we have with people who are suffering from substance abuse in the bid, drinking in public, crystal meth, and other substances, and which also kind of relates to the panhandling issue as well, because those, the monies kind of are often used for that. So, um, <clears throat> Housing Works, which is a very reputable um, nonprofit here in uh, LA, has come up with a, a concept of, uh, called Recovery Works that would include a sobering station, which is something that is used in some cities where people who are suffering from um, any kind of substance abuse can be taken by the LAPD, to be taken by the bid, or could walk in themselves, to be taken by a friend to come in and um, uh, detox, sober up, and be connected with peers who have also come you know, into recovery uh, to s surround them with support and you know, conversation about possibly bringing an end to that lifestyle. So we had a meeting in Supervisor Kuehl's office um, two weeks ago to talk about this and to see if there might be some grant funds available that could test this as a pilot here in Hollywood. So again, these are throwing these things up against the wall, but I think the, the, quite, the issue is we're not just sitting on our hands and letting people drink themselves to death out there or whatever. We're trying to see what, what options are and what best practices exist in other communities. And this is, this is a wonderfully thorough <coughs> excuse me, list of all the resources. And um, you know, it, it, it helps explain to visitors who they can give to or how they can contribute to whatever they think is, you know, their preferred constituency. Yeah, yeah. It's whether it's feeding or Carrie. Yeah. Is there a way that you can get an article in any kind of a publication <clears throat> that goes out to the public other than just our own committee meetings that explains what we do and how many times these people get I mean how how inept the system is as far as holding them. How it just circulates them through that's, over and over. that's what we're trying to do with this outreach to the LA Times. So she did respond back. The editor is is interested. And so we sent just kind of a very uh, brief synopsis going back to 2006 of all our interactions. But we have, we have reams of data that we can look at. If the LA Times doesn't take this, I'll go to the New York Times. I mean, this, this is a story that is waiting to be told because we have tried so hard to help this guy. And we have helped other people who, who have successfully gotten off the street, so it can be done. Um, How many times have you run into Richard? Oh, hundreds. Hundreds. I've documented, uh, I'm doing some more research. I've already filled in dozens more entries, but we have to document a small fraction of right. it because we, it's every day, multiple contacts. I'm sure LAPD the same. Uh, but even if I just pull up the ones we've documented, which I'm doing, it'll be hundreds of contacts. You know, I think that. It's just, it's not just that one person, because whenever you read something about one person, you think, well, but the volume of people that we have helped and the volume of times that they have gone through the system and come out three days later and better off, yeah. is just, it's astounding. And people need to know their tax money is paying for this system that isn't doing good to anybody because it isn't right. You're trying the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Exactly. Is. It's not <coughs> about them and it's spending money and it's... <coughs> no, I, I agree completely. Well, and I also, you know, <coughs> this is a personal editorial, so Adrian, make sure you get this right. I think the LAPD has been unfairly put in the middle of dealing with systemic deficiencies in our mental health system and our substance abuse recovery system and LAPD ends up being first responder for people that are otherwise 
um, marginalized by our by our county system. So that's just stand <laughs> by that. I tweeted that. So I'm in trouble for that. Okay, so um, everything else here, I think, just look at the monitoring, accomplished, parked. If there's anything that you you know want to bring up, like why is that parked or why aren't we working on that? On the next page, um, on say Hollywood Nights, uh, I would just say that a couple things that we're doing in this area is we're trying to change the conversation about Hollywood and what happens here at night, move it away from just a nightclub culture to something that celebrates organically some of the positive uh, experiences that you can have here at night in Hollywood, entertainment, music, comedy, etc. So to that end, we're, we're working with the Sunset Bid on a neighborhood festival in November that would <coughs> collate and curate existing things happening here in the community, um, music, comedy, um, the arts, uh, over a four-night period that will, I think, shine a positive light on how you can have a nice experience in Hollywood night. So that's in the works right now. And um, <laughs> we're also working uh, Joe's taking the lead on uh, trying to continue to organize the property owners in the mid-bid um, to take a, a more proactive look at how they can help work with their neighbors to improve the tenant mix and the business offerings in that area. So those are... Any other <coughs> issues that you think should be on here, just let us know. And um, we'd be happy to try to make this as accurate as possible and as comprehensive as possible. Um, shall we move on? Yeah. Okay, so we talked about the, well, let's, let's move to the reports. Or do you want to go to um, the uh, Bronson Sunset Intersection? Oh, okay. yeah, I'm sorry, last thing. Um, <clears throat> so we did, um, as uh, Carol just mentioned, both streetscape committees went out two or three weeks ago and did a four hour walkthrough of both bids looking at all the conditions that need to be fixed and repaired. And we noticed that the, the Denny's Bronson, it's the off ramp from the 101 freeway onto Sunset Boulevard. It is, it is a problem area that has kind of festered um, a number of homeless encampments in the back of that property, uh, people panhandling on the, on the uh, off ramp, trash, you know things that we own that we need to we need to fix. So we're we're going to start next week with a meeting with Denny's uh, to see you know how they can help us work together, and we'll probably put together a meeting with LAPD and Caltrans and some others to try to batten down the hatches on that little section that that entry into Hollywood. <laughs> and just for info, I already spoke to the slow for that area. They've done a lot of work there already. They've taken on truckload after truckload of debris. So they've been kind of lonely, alone working on it, so maybe we can give them some time. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's move on uh, to the reports. Uh, Steve, why don't you keep the floor and tell us what's going on in. Okay, this report takes us from March 30th through uh, May the 3rd, which is the uh, 18th week of the year. Uh, looking at trends compared to this time last year, um, our arrests and high visibility controls are down somewhat while citizen contacts, business checks, and radio calls are up. Um, our radio calls are actually up by 165, which isn't a huge number, but it's fairly early in the year, and that's a stat we watch very closely because it, it affects everything else we do, our proactive patrols and, and special projects such as the one Carrie's talking about. So we'll be watching that uh, month by month to see how, how it goes. Um, and I'll just give you a few samples of what we've been up to during this period of some of the interesting um, events. On March 31st, our unarmed officers were flagged down by uh, Jessica at a check cashing business on Hollywood, and there was a man inside causing somewhat of a disturbance. Well, he we went in, he was cashing a check, and basically just had a drawing on it and uh, an amount. So, obviously, he had mental illness issues. We were able to convince him to ease out the door and cash the check at another time. The serious part is we have a lot of mentally ill that are actually quite violent as well. This man was harmless, um, but really, he, he needed some help as well. But they're just our resources. Um, on April 3rd, we got a call at LA Fitness on El Centro, and Priscilla advised us that someone had taken off their padlock off of a gate and put their own lock on it. Oh, um, so That happens to me a lot. Yeah, it's kind of an odd thing. <laughs> and it's, it's a touchy they area. Lock, they lock and they lock it with their own lock, and then they, they can come in and out, and you can't go. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a gated area um, to the rear. 
Um, so we had them cut the lock. We, we don't want to get involved in that. Not knowing what would be inside, and it turned out to be a 15 by 15 foot area, and uh, two people had set up tents in there. And uh, Marissa and Anthony were uh, willing to move their tent, but it's just funny how they just took over that area, you know, pretty bold. So we set them on the way. Um, on the 20th, we got a call of uh, a man asking for assistance at the pharmacy on Coanga. Um, this man was named William. He was partially blind. Um, interesting story. Um, William made a few mistakes on this day. He lives in the neighborhood. He uh, picked up a prostitute and took her home, mistake number one. Number two, or number two, he went into his bathroom, took off all his clothes, preparing for his date. Um, when he came out, his date and his phone and charger were gone. So I guess he went about his business. He later went to the pharmacy and saw the woman. Um, a big argument ensued. So who does he call big security? Why? What we're supposed to do? I don't know. She was gone when we got there. And I, as I thought about it, I thought, you know, if it was me, I think I would have just slunk away. And yeah. Hold my hand and forgot about story. it. But for him, yeah, he's telling the world about it. And he referred him to LAPD for a report. I don't know if he actually called or not. But that's a typical. Several bad decisions in that. Unfortunately, that's not a two way typical call for us. Uh, going on to page two on uh, April 28th, um, we got a call with Capitol Records, another man refusing to leave. Um, the guard was a directed us to the uh, Andy Gump portable to the rear of the property. Um, the guys opened the door, they're amazed to find this man completely upside down with his head on the floor, absolutely wedged in, he could not get out. We untangled him, got him out, and he just simply gathered up his stuff and wandered off muttering as he left. Another man that obviously could use some help. Um, I have a little section here called Hostile Encounters. I'm not going to go into those, but if you have a chance to read them. It's just that uh, I'm starting to document. We have seen an increase in violence. LAPD has seen it as well. And we're just trying to, Carrie's asked me to sort of get a handle on what exactly is happening. So we're documenting that. At the bottom of page three, you'll see uh, meetings attended. My staff and I attended 18 meetings, and that's with law enforcement, the business community, and the homeless outreach community. And we do that to extend our influence representing you and also the pool resources with these same groups that share our goal, which is improving the quality of life in the good area. Um, homeless outreach is one of the tools we use to improve the quality of life. Um, there's a lot of great stories here. It's something we do day in and day out. Um, I'll just cover really quick. I'll go to uh, page five. Um, the Starbucks at uh, Sunset and Mine, there's a manager named Marjorie, and she gives us her leftover pastries every morning. Um, she also does other volunteer work with youth um, in Hollywood. So we go around and wake people up at 6 in the morning, and people don't want to be woken up. I can, I can guarantee you that, and especially if you had mental illness and substance abuse. It's not pleasant to have us shaking you and, hey, it's time to get up. So we actually will give people outreach information and we give them a pastry. And what we're doing is building a rapport with them. It's, it's unlikely they're going to want to fight us. We're actually becoming sort of a friend. And then later on, if, if there's a moment when they're willing to accept services, we have a relationship. And so that's been very successful. We've been doing that for some weeks now. And it, it really has smoothed out some of the, you know, exactly in the morning. So, so far, so good on that. On to page six, on uh, April 16th, we found an elderly man uh, face down in the street, having convulsions, um, unconscious but breathing. We had another team come and they actually had to block traffic so he wouldn't be run over. Uh, we got the LAPD and paramedics there and he was taken to the hospital. And that's just something um, we're routinely, oftentimes the first responders to arrive on things. This is just something we observe while on patrol. I'm, I'm convinced we've saved many lives during the years. <clears throat> on April 25th, um, we spoke to a man named David. Um, he was very emotional. He's a longtime homeless man. We've tried to help him many times, and he always backs off as soon as we get a uh, path ready to help him. On this day, he was very motivated. He said he wanted to go into the shelter. We got paths through the scene. They told him what was required. And the main thing, the main hurdle was getting a TB test. You have to have this test to get into the shelter. So he agreed to go that Wednesday. Once again, he didn't show up. Um, he then called a few days later, and talked to one of my officers, and said, look, I'll, I'll do it today at 2 o'clock. So my officer, unbeknownst to me, it was after his shift, agreed to meet him and drive him to the clinic. I would have given, paid the officer to do this had I known, but this is not atypical of some of our officers. Um, so my officer did show up, and, and David was not there again. So David is still on the street. But we'll just keep trying. That's all we can do. Um, on to the next page, um, enforcement, another one of our tools for problem solving. 
Um, I won't bore you with the stats, but we made 254 arrests between the two bids, and it's broken down by the two bids as well as combined, and if you're interested, you can read through that at your leisure. And just a couple of the interesting arrests on page eight. <clears throat> we got a call of, uh, on April 1st, a call at the same Starbucks that's given us the pastries of a man who stole three travel mugs and fled the scene with the manager in pursuit. Um, we found the man at uh, Ivor and Sunset. Um, LAPD arrived. Um, we waited for them, directed him to the man. They placed him under arrest. Uh, the man was named Melvin, and the detective told us he was a, sus a suspect in at least 20 to 40 thefts. So Melvin was a good guy to get off the street. Um, down at the bottom of the page, um, we got a call from uh, Angel telling us there was a man with no shirt walking around with two knives in his waistband. Uh, we found the man and kept him under surveillance. And this is like the last call. We understand our role. We're not the police. We're security. So we're watching him and we're calling <coughs> LAPD, bringing them to the scene. If this man would have pulled a knife on a tourist or a citizen, we would have taken action, but, but we didn't have to. And LAPD arrived. We guided him to the man. They ordered him to put his hands on a wall. He went to his waistband, pulled out the knives. And this is a very tense moment. The very reason we're doing surveillance instead of confronting him. <clears throat> this is a shoot or don't shoot situation coming. We don't want to be in that situation. So through tactics and training, we stay out of there. If we have to engage, we will. Luckily, the man threw the knives down. He was taken into custody without incident. And uh, the LAPD took him away. Uh, they later informed us that the man had an outstanding no bail felony warrant. So another good guy to get off the street. And uh, that's our preferred method of, of those type of arrests. Our deployment remained the same during this period, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Sunday. And uh, our training during this period included uh, bomb threats, protocol for security officers, search techniques, telephonic, telephonic bomb threats, and legal update. Thank you. Any questions for Steve? Uh, yes, there was about three weeks ago, um, they blocked the street uh, in front of the marijuana dispensary on the central. They were doing was, a search warrant, I believe. And I believe Commander Romano was there, if I'm mistaken. I know they did a warrant on one of them. I saw a crime scene, I thought maybe something, not crime scene, I saw the yellow tape. I, I don't yeah, know, maybe, maybe you speak that, but I thought they, they raided one of the, uh, a search warrant on one of them. We've got, <clears throat> we've had some issues with some of our dispensaries uh, lately. They've become a, a community issue because of problems, not just them being there, but the other issue is that persons are going in and obtaining uh, the marijuana legally, but then selling it to minors. Okay. So that's become a major concern, and enforcement has been happening to take care of that. Yeah, I see that little stretch street. Those which which street? Central? Central. Central. What did I saw? Uh, Twenty yeah. in the center. Is, oh, the street is not. Oh yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I have to commend Andrews. I was walking down Sunset and Vine and witnessed the April 14th confrontation with Jonathan the Blaze. And to say he was extremely hostile and, uh, and, and appeared to be under the influence of narcotics is an understatement. I mean, this guy was out of control and flying high. And you had three, four guys there and got him to turn and go away, but boy, he would, I, I thought he was coming at, at me, you, or you know everybody, and then I was also worried this guy was so hot he was gonna run right out in the middle of, of Sunset Boulevard or Cahuenga and just you know commit suicide, because he was I mean, lunar out of it. You know, it was bizarre, he uh, actually ran up on the bus bench and got inches from one of my officer's face. That's another time you gotta make that decision. He's really invading your safety and your space. Yeah, he was threatening. But it's funny, an MTA bus pulled up, and we're at a bus stop, and the bus driver's waving him on the bus. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, you got to be kidding. And the passengers are like, oh, my God, don't get this guy on the bus. Oh, oh. And finally, the bus driver caught on and drove off. But it was, yeah, it was an potentially... I saw that whole thing go down, scene. and it was it, it was very well played by your, your team. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for Steve? Okay, let's uh, move on to LAPD. Um, Sergeant? Uh, crime stat-wise, we're, we're hanging in there for this from year to date. Uh, right now, our sexual assaults are down. Our robberies are up slightly. Our aggravated assaults are right around the same as they were last year, year to date. And uh, our burglaries, our residential burglaries are down. Our grand theft autos are up slightly. And our burglary promoter vehicles are up. 
slightly. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of concern is about uh, a lot of the burglary from motor vehicles and the thefts and everything being knocked down from felonies and misdemeanors in the enforcement. And you know, if we arrest these people, then they basically go to jail, they go to court, and then they get right back out. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of our strategy has been. Uh, really for especially for the entertainment district is going to the investigative part which is where i come in and i have a team of officers that we do uh more investigation more follow up and try and develop cases to make sure that the really bad folks are taken care of whether it's we make the case better for the district attorney so they'll actually file a charge or if the district attorney absolutely won't then we'll develop it for the city prosecutor and they'll make sure that they get to stay away so that, I didn't even think about that. Under Prop 47, a lot of those um, thefts are now just misdemeanors. Right. right, to the point where if they, you know, it used to be if you take a car, it's either you're driving without the owner's consent or it's grand theft auto, if you can develop the intent. Now, if you've got an $800 Toyota Camry, that's... Yeah, it's a monetary threshold, the, the value of the car, right? And and the DA's filing criteria is actually a little bit higher than, than what we're, what we're mm -hmm. the letter of the law. So those are some of the things, the obstacles that we uh, are getting through, but uh, the HED team, we're, we're trying to get past that, and if we can't get the district attorney to bite, then we'll develop the case and we'll get it to the city prosecutor, and we'll get stayaways. Stayaways have been our biggest tool right now, especially with our problem uh, persons in HED because our neighborhood prosecutor can, um, if we get them to plead out, uh, a lot of times these people are actually getting decent deals because they might get hit with five misdemeanor counts, but they go to arraignment and they're given an offer and they're also shown the HED map and said, stay out of here. And they go, okay. And they're just both that day and gone. And then we have a list of, of these persons with those stayaways. If our officers see them, they go for contempt of court. And you guys have access to that list? We keep in contact with Andrews. Our officers for HED are keeping in contact with his officers to make sure. A lot of times, their guys are telling us before we even know about it. It's it's a, it's a good communication thing that we're going back and forth. We make sure that they understand, know that this one individual, Giles, he's a CD vendor, very aggressive guy. He looks like Bobby Brown. They were on the assumption he had a, a stay away. He does not. But hopefully after June 25th, he will because he's going to court. Mm -hmm. So um, we're keeping up. That's another strategy is just making sure our officers are talking to Andrew's officers at the Fed office and keeping it going because that's been our best strategy. Now, you know, the good guy characters are approaching us and giving us information saying that Mother's Day they were out and it was great out on the boulevard because of all the bad guys that we've taken off the street and getting stayaways. So when one of those guys is coming up and saying, hey, the bid guys and the HED guys are doing a great job, it makes me feel us feel real good. Sergeant? Yes, ma'am. When you get stayaways, are they for the HEB and for the Sunset Fine bid or just for whatever? The, the stayaways are divisional wide. Um, if, if we get a stayaway, let's say the uh, the person that threw um, the rock at, uh, at Dwayne Johnson or uh, the, it was the same guy that, that threw uh, sugar on Adam Levine, uh, the stay away that we got on that person was not only in the HED area, but was also involved with uh, any uh, red carpet event that has to do with high profile celebrities. So we mapped him out of, uh, not that it's going to keep him away, but we mapped him out of any area that he could potentially throw stuff at stars. Uh, so uh, we, we were in contact with not only the bid, but also the security at all the uh, studios around here, Paramount, uh, Warner Brothers, uh, those places, so that they have a picture of this guy, and if he shows up, then they can arrest him for that stayaway. So it's divisional wide. And, and the stayaways, uh, Jackie Lawson, our neighborhood prosecutor, we can we can be a little bit more flexible. She can she can try and tailor it to what we need. Like the captain was saying, with that particular issue. This individual was was going after talent and entertainment people, so Jackie can sort of make it that way. If we have CD vendors or costume characters that are aggressive um, and committing crimes on Hollywood Boulevard, then the standard is to do the HED map 
the Hollywood Entertainment District now. Is so, there any way of extending it? Because when you move the mod of the HEB, they come to the next street, which is Sunset. I think the box actually is bigger. It goes, bigger. To, it goes yeah. to Sunset, yeah. La Brea, Argyle, to... Uh, so to, even though they call it HEB, uh, it's for their purposes, it's a box that they have to find. And so it goes to Santa Monica. It does not. It goes to South Side. Sunset. 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 Oh, okay. Well, we'll we'll map them out of an area where it's probable that he would uh, do that type of uh, event again. Uh, if it, if he does that outside that area, we'll just extend the stay away the next time we arrest him. If we have a problem, child, what we can do is we can focus on that particular thing. I mean, it, especially if it's addressed to the officers, if it's addressed to our neighborhood prosecutor, we can do our best to try and make it work. Because like the guy with the knives, yes, we get people like that. And I'm one of my restaurants is just below Sunset, so it's in the other bit, but it's not in the area. But it could be taken down the fountain, perhaps. Yeah. We'll, uh, you know what? I'll talk to Jackie about that, and I'll, we'll, uh, I'll definitely mention that to to Jackie. We definitely tailor make our, our stayaways for each individual person, depending on what they're doing. Like I said, the the guy that's uh, throwing stuff on celebrities, we've yes, we've we, we've essentially uh, mapped him out of every red carpet event that occurs in the city of Los Angeles. I mean, that's that's what we've done with that guy. So I have a question on the um, burglary and theft of motor vehicles. Um, the, the patterns, are, are there any patterns you're noticing? Is it happening in the day, happening at night? We had talked about this like two years ago where there's certain streets. I mean, it seems to kind of be everywhere. You know, we, uh, we have daily missions, we have weekly missions. We have, we really think outside the box. We have plain clothes officers, uniform officers, bicycle officers. And honestly, it's really, it's really spread out. It's really sporadic. And a lot of the, the theft comes from people just not locking their things up. Mm -hmm. Or leaving them on the seat. Exactly. Yeah. If, they, if people don't lock it, I to keep it. And Irv, Officer Isabella, and his partners, the senior lead officers, and our, uh, our cadets, they must hand out thousands and thousands and thousands of those flyers throughout Hollywood um, just to try and get people to do that. And then also with bid, we share those with bid. and. That's the biggest thing. If we could just get people to do that, it would alleviate a lot of it. Um, you know, the other things too is we get career criminals that come through. We'll get one guy, and that could cut our crime rate for the week and a half. Right. And I think you know, that just happened this last week. So that's the thing: is our detectives, our officers, working together with BID to try and determine who our problem children are, get them off the street, and then also we've got these opportunists. Just convince these people, please lock your stuff up, lock it, hide it, keep it. Yeah, but Ben's talking about a, a strategy that's uh, that's not only divisional wide, but it's it's city wide uh, as far as the lock it, hide it, keep it. If you're talking about geographically, if there's areas that that are problems, uh, since I've been in the division, I've I've identified six different areas that are problems, and they just kind of rotate depending on uh, uh, those those strategies that we work on every single week. One of the areas, obviously, the HED area, the, the, the part that we're usually talking about in this meeting, uh, parking lots, that type of stuff, those are crimes of opportunity. But we also have in our division, uh, burglary for motor vehicle problems up in Runyon Canyon, people just uh, leaving their stuff in their car while they go on a walk. Uh, that pops up on occasion. On occasion, the, the pro problem pops up down at Western and Santa Monica. So, I mean, as, as problems pop up, we, we deal with those things as they come up. Uh, like Sergeant Fernandez was saying, this, one, this last week we did take one person into custody in an area where there was a lot of burglary for motor vehicles. Magically, every burglary for motor vehicle went away this week in that area. And it... It cut our crime in half because that one individual is taken into custody. So, just the profile of that individual—are they selling the stuff then, or you know? It's it's drugs, right? Uh, mostly. You know, uh, a lot of these a lot of these folks, for whatever reason, are thieves. 
they will do whatever it takes to either support their habit, they don't know any better, or just to live. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of them have very long criminal histories. And because they're getting these thefts or these things where they basically get out, you know, they go to, to jail maybe for a couple of days and then they're right back out. There's nothing forcing them to they go. They have no other way to make money. Correct. Yeah. And so there, there are some places that, um, you know, if somebody gets an iPhone, they not necessarily aren't going to be able to sell it to another individual, especially once you go on the cloud and swipe it. But the parts are worth a ton of money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are some other things, some places that could be taking those in. So we'll try to identify where's the stuff going. And the actual <laughs> crime that you're talking about, burglary from a motor vehicle, is a very um, low risk crime for a uh, theft or a thief. Um, we we catch very uh, few of them, and when we do catch them, um, like Sergeant Fernandez says, it's it's a revolving door. They get out uh, very quickly. Um, you know, the things that obviously would help is is people taking personal ownership of their car, uh, locking it, hiding hiding their stuff, keeping their their stuff. But as as the business owners and as uh, technology. Uh, improves the the cameras that are out there the things that we can do to identify who that person is uh, we can we can raise the the uh, level of uh, how many people we are taking into custody uh, when we get a good description through um, video we put out crime alerts community alerts um, we talk to uh, parking lot attendants uh, Anybody that we can find that, that would see those type of people. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's it's one of those those crimes that, as technology helps us, uh, we'll be able to to do more stuff uh, and, with that. And a success story of that is um, some uh, HED officers were out. They observed two males drinking in public, made contact with them. They saw them holding plastic bags. Inside those plastic bags looked like the contents of the inside of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. They started talking to them. They said, where's your ID? It's in my back pocket. It was a female's wallet mm -hmm. with a female ID and another female's ID and other people's social security cards. So further investigation revealed that that individual was a two-strike felon and had done prior to four front burglaries. Um, they determined the victims of those licenses hadn't even known, but they lived at 1724 McAdam. So they made, our, my investigators did fall up over there and found five victims that lived in that building. And what happened is this suspect knew of the building because he had a, an acquaintance that used to live there. He, uh, we caught him on video making his way as a lady was entering. They grabbed the door real quick and were able to sneak in. They went down to the lower underground parking lot and hit door checked everything. And you know, people keep cash, IDs, yeah. <laughs> all this stuff in their cars and they forget to hit the lock button. These guys didn't even have to break a window. But the problem is, is they went into a secured building that's a residential building. Mm -hmm. So it's now a residential burglary. Mm -hmm. And this is his third strike. <coughs> He's done. Mm -hmm. He's done. And we have him on video and everything else. So that's big. When we get something like that, you know, you see the crime dip down and then it takes care of it. Hopefully, for now. <laughs> are, are there any efforts underway by the BIDs to, um, or any legislative like, or, or, or is there any lobby at the state to try to repeal AB 109 or Prop 47 or anything like that going on? I think that um, it's the Prop 47 thing is um, too soon to tell. It's you know it's been six months since no, you know November when it passed, and I I know um, uh, that even at LASA when we were postulating why homelessness is up, we decided not to touch that issue. We're going to let someone else do the analysis on whether or not. Part of the reason why homelessness is up is because people are in crime. In crime, yeah. So it's it's touchy. Uh, it's a touchy issue. Um, it's something that we may want to put on our on our sheet eventually. It's, it's going to be discussed at our at our summit. Yeah. That is one of the, the topic areas. Okay. We have no major events upcoming after Armenian the uh, Armenian march that yeah. went very it's well huge. and probably had the largest crowd that we've <coughs> ever had in the city of LA. Sir, would you agree? Yes, and uh, we policed it with about 150 officers. 120,000 expect. Uh, we had an estimate of 120,000 people, and, and uh, we used about 120 cops, and we made it work. So, and and that's the, that's an example of uh, working with the uh, the organizers or the march mm -hmm. people. 
Uh, we had meetings uh, weeks in advance to try to get their cooperation and their monitors worked with hand in hand with us. Um, it, it, it obviously grew a whole lot bigger than we thought it was going to be. We thought it would be about 50,000. Uh, it, it more than doubled that. But uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, the cooperation that we got was absolutely phenomenal. And if all marches were like that, uh, that's, I mean, that, that would be the model for marches around the country. I mean, seriously. It was very peaceful. And there was great communication to people as well. We didn't know about it that day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I do have one question. When 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 you were talking about the um, the event in November. Um, oh, the the, the 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 festival. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is the policing uh, um, uh, thoughts for that? Because we would there, like to include you in that conversation. There are two major events right around November where we call in um, police from all over the city. Halloween. Halloween, and then the Christmas parade. Yeah. So uh, I'm just wondering about taxing. We don't anticipate it's going to be, you know, no street closures, you know, things okay. like that. Okay. All right. But it's all in existing venues. Okay. We're that, then, then that's fine. But uh, we definitely want to bring you in into the into the discussion about it, so. Yeah, I just didn't want to tax uh, the city of Los Angeles because uh, uh, Halloween and the Christmas parade, we do bring in major resources from out, from throughout the city. Terry, were there, I don't think there was any outdoor entertainment planned in that. Correct. It was just highlighting places that you could go. Right. So kind of like a fringe festival for music, where okay. we would actually curate everything that's happening and encourage people to come over those four days. Right. So we would want more foot traffic, full restaurants, etc., mm -hmm. and definitely would want you to be aware All of right. it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for LAPD? Thank you very much, Sergeant. Please excuse me. And uh, we unfortunately don't have the sheriffs, we don't have the city attorney, and we don't have uh, CD thirteen. So we're making tremendous progress. Um, and what what is the last issue on our agenda? Um, there's nothing new to report on stakeholders plus much you did anything. No. All right. Well thank you all for coming. This meeting is adjourned.